Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Oral Health and its Link to Systemic, Economic, and Public Health. Part two, Dental Care Prevents Chronic Disease and Saves Money. My name is Donnie Zemmel, and I'm the Training and Engagement Manager for the Region 5 Public Health Training Center. The RVPHTC is part of the National Public Health Learning Network, a consortium of 10 regional public health training centers and the country's most comprehensive resource for public health training and workforce development. We seek to strengthen skills of the current and future public health workforce through learning tools, continuing education, and student development. We encourage you to check out our other training offerings at our catalog at rvphtc.org. This webinar is brought to you in partnership with the National Coalition of Dentists for Health Equity. This series will present the economic and health benefits of dental care on systemic health, and today's second and final session will explore the associations between oral health and economic health. Next slide, please. So a little bit of housekeeping before we jump in. All participants are in a listen-only mode. We encourage you to add your questions or comments into the chat box. We will not be using the raise hand or Q&A functions in the webinar. Depending on the question, we may type an answer back to you or we may save it for the designated mm -hmm. Q&A segment at the end. And we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. The slides were included in the reminder email sent out this morning, and they're also available for download from the Canvas course site. And in a moment, I'll put that link again in the chat. Today's webinar is being recorded and we'll send out a notification once the recording is ready in a couple of weeks. And lastly, there is no continuing education credit for today's webinar but there is a certificate of completion available as long as you meet the attendance and evaluation requirements. For attendance, we'll take care of that. Uh, Zoom gives us a handy uh, attendance file afterwards, and the evaluation will open at the end of the session, and we'll put that link in the chat as well. Next slide, please. Great. All right, so I'm now happy to welcome our moderator, David Mayware, the Managing Director, of the National Coalition of Dentists for Health Equity. David is a former executive director for the Ohio Public Health Association and has over 50 years of experience in the nonprofit arena, managing complex local and statewide social service agencies and policy advocacy organizations. I'm now happy to pass it over to David to get things started for today. Great, thanks, Donnie. Uh, I really appreciate the work that you all are doing to make these webinars as successful as they are. Uh, just a little bit of background on the National Coalition of Dentists for Health Equity. It's our job to unite dentists who support evidence-based practices in the U.S. as a means to advance the goal of comprehensive health equity with a specific interest in oral health equity for all. Examples of such practices include community water fluoridation, the use of dental sealants, the inclusion of fully funded comprehensive oral health benefits and public programs such as Medicare and Medicaid, and the utilization of cost-effective workforce models such as dental therapists. We're grateful for the financial support which comes from the CareQuest Institute for Oral Health and the 80 plus members of the National Coalition of Dentists for Health Equity. To the program. There's been a significant number of publications over the past two decades about the oral health systemic health connection. These papers demonstrate a clear cost savings to insurers who hold both medical and dental insurance on beneficiaries. Many have indicated better health outcomes and even longer lifespan when individuals have access to dental care. Most authors conclude there is an association between oral health and systemic health, but only a few authors have suggested there is a causal link. This is part two of our series, presenting the economic and health benefits of dental care on systemic health. This second session will discuss the associations between oral health and economic health. Today, we are fortunate to again be joined by Dr. Scott Tomar, Professor and Associate Dean for Prevention and Public Sciences, University of Illinois Chicago, College of Dentistry. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Tomar. Welcome and thanks for being here. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, David, for the introduction. Thank you, Donnie, for all your uh, your help in coordinating this. And thank you all for 
for being here and for those that, that are coming back for part two, uh, thank you for returning. Um, so first, I, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. I'm not, not uh, no financial or other connections to uh, any of the um, uh, any products or, or uh, services that I'll be discussing. Uh, I also just note that anything that I'll be uh, talking about, you know, really reflects just my own opinions and interpretations. It doesn't necessarily reflect either the policies or positions of either the National Coalition of Dentists for Health Equity or my employer, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. So the uh, the, the overall um, uh, objectives for this series, uh, this two-part series, was to talk about the connections between oral health and systemic health, uh, to recognize the economic benefits of dental care on the healthcare system, and to discuss better health outcomes and longer lifespan when individuals have access to dental care. So uh, today, you know, and again, I'll, I'll recap what we talked about uh, uh, the, the last session. Um, but you know, the outline for today, I'll, I'll be giving a brief re recap uh, for periodontitis as a cause of uh, some major health outcomes. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the evidence for uh, economic benefits, uh, for, uh, particularly for uh, for periodontal treatment. Uh, on uh, healthcare costs, and finally, uh, I'll you know put forward my recommendations for action, and I think we'll have some time at the end for really a broader discussion on uh, what those of us that, that felt strongly enough to be involved uh, with the session, uh, what we can then do with this information uh, to try to move the needle. So again, this is a, a, a slide that I included in the last presentation. You know, as David had mentioned in the introduction. You know, we, we now have several decades of, of uh, literature on, uh, on, on associations between uh, oral health conditions and various other health conditions. I, I'd say most of it really focusing on uh, periodontal conditions uh, because uh, uh, periodontitis is, uh, is a form of chronic inflammation. And so there, there's a, a fairly long laundry list of diseases for which there's been at least uh, some papers published on a uh, reported association between periodontitis and these various health outcomes. Uh, I, I'd say that the preponderance of evidence really relates to those on the, the left side of this, on, of this screen, on you know, particularly cardiovascular diseases, uh, diabetes, particularly uh, type 2 diabetes, and uh, pregnancy outcomes. And so the last time I, I went through uh, a number of studies that have looked at the association between periodontitis and uh, a number of these uh, conditions. Um, so I'm just going to sort of recap the the findings uh, for those. Uh, so the, you know, first one does does treating periodontitis prevent uh, cardiovascular diseases? And again, I had presented uh, a lot of the details in this, so I'm just sort of summarizing it with the findings from. Uh, relatively uh, new Cochrane uh, review on that question. Uh, the conclusions in that in that systematic review were, were for primary prevention of cardiovascular diseases in people diagnosed with periodontitis and metabolic syndrome. Uh, they concluded there was very low certainty evidence that was inconclusive about the effects of scaling and root planing um, uh, plus antibiotics compared to super gingival scaling. Uh, the caveat that, you know, just the, uh, the, the, the types and quality of evidence that are accepted for, uh, for Cochrane reviews, uh, there was only one study that was included looking at primary prevention of, uh, of cardiovascular diseases. So again, you know, we don't, we don't have a large body of evidence, uh, but in part it's because of the, the, the threshold uh, that, that that's required to make the the Cochrane Review. Uh, their second conclusion, uh, no reliable evidence available regarding secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease in people diagnosed with chronic periodontitis and, you know, and, and who already had a, a chronic, uh, a, a cardiovascular disease diagnosed. And again, based on, uh, on, you know, a very, very small number of studies. Again, I think there was only one study that, that met their inclusion criteria and, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the tagline, uh, further trials are needed. Uh, you know, but the, behind all this, uh, there, there actually was a, 
uh, a fairly significant number of fairly consistent evidence uh, showing uh, that the the presence of of uh, periodontitis um, you know did have some predictive power that that uh, an overwhelming uh, number of those studies actually did find uh, in in cohort studies uh, association between uh, periodontitis and either the onset or or uh, progression of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, second question was whether uh, treating periodontal uh, uh, periodontal disease uh, prevented adverse uh, birth outcomes. And again, this is a, um, the, the conclusions from a, uh, a relatively recent, you know, this one's about five years old, but the, the most recent one, uh, the, uh, the Cochrane um, uh, collaboration has, has uh, issued on this, uh, at least as of the time that when this is published, that is not clear of periodontal treatment during pregnancy has an impact on, on preterm birth, uh, but there was low quality evidence that periodontal treatment may reduce uh, low, low birth weight, although, you know, again, uh, with, with limited confidence, uh, insufficient evidence to determine which periodontal treatment is better in preventing adverse uh, obstetric outcomes. And again, recommended uh, uh, future research uh, that, that should report you know, both the periodontal outcomes along the obstetric outcomes. And that was in part because some of these studies, uh, they, they uh, provided scaling and root planning, but didn't necessarily report whether there was improvement in, in periodontal health during that trial. And then the, um, you know, the, the final uh, Cochrane review uh, uh, that I'll be mentioning on, um, what, you know, th this one asked the question of whether treating periodontitis improved glycemic control in people with diabetes. Um, and in that review, the, they reported a, an absolute reduction in, uh, in A1C uh, three or four months after treatment. Uh, uh, both at six month and at and at twelve month, and, and I highlighted you know what I think are really the the most dramatic changes uh, that were reported in this uh, systematic review compared to uh, to to its previous uh, iteration, which was only a couple of years ago. Um, really has you know to, to me has really changed uh, what we're able to say with with. Uh, fairly firm confidence. Uh, it says, we now have moderate certainty evidence that periodontal treatment using subgingival uh, instrumentation improves glycemic control in people with both periodontitis and diabetes by a clinically significant amount when compared to no treatment or usual care. Uh, so again, th this, um, you know, this to me really has, uh, has moved the needle on the discussion. You know, we've talked about uh, the bidirectional association between periodontitis and diabetes for for a long time, for probably 20 years, uh, but we now have uh, you know, sufficient clinical evidence uh, that treating periodontal disease really did have a clinically clinically meaningful impact uh, on uh, on diabetes um, and and, di or, and glycemic control. Uh, in people that have been diagnosed with, with diabetes. So, you know, to me, what that tells me, other than the fact that, that um, you know, we now can improve their periodontal health, uh, we really can improve uh, glycemic control. And, and again, because the, the, the probable mechanism by which this happens is by control of, uh, of local inflammation, uh, I, you know, even though, again, you know, the, the um, the evidence from the, the Cochrane reviews, which again, you know, very stringent criteria to meet their, their criteria for inclusion in those reviews. But, but to me, one of the takeaways um, uh, from, from this is, well, we now have evidence that uh, treating local periodontal inflammation uh, you know, has an impact on a major systemic disease. So, you know, while we can't yet extend that to other diseases, I honestly believe that it's really only a matter of time before we can, uh, you know, we can uh, demonstrate what's now been demonstrated uh, for uh, glycemic control. And so again, I, I, you know, I see this as as really a major step forward in this discussion, and and um, you know, really informs what we should be doing not only on the research side, but what we could be doing on the the clinical and advocacy side uh, of this question. So again, just you know, to summarize, 
what I presented uh, in part one, fairly consistent evidence from cohort studies that periodontitis predicted preterm birth, uh, cardiovascular diseases of type one diabetes. Uh, the, the biologic mechanisms for all these are likely so related to systemic inflammation uh, in part stemming from, from a local inflammation, uh, which is what periodontitis is. Uh, moderate certainty evidence that periodontal treatment improves glycemic control in people with diabetes. Uh, but again, you know, the uh, you know, even in light of the, the conclusions from the uh, the, the Cochrane reviews on uh, cardiovascular diseases and preterm birth, uh, insufficient evidence that periodontal treatment reduced the risk does not mean that periodontitis is not causal for those diseases. And and I'll you know I'll talk about that a little bit more, but but again, just just the fact that we don't yet have sufficient evidence uh, that that uh, treating periodontitis uh, you know leads to uh, to changes in outcomes related to cardiovascular or preterm birth uh, does not that is not equivalent to periodontitis not necessarily being causal. And and why do I say that is well you know all of these chronic diseases um, you know involve uh, a you know, the, a number of different um, uh, causal pathways. Um, you know, the, these are complex chronic diseases with many different factors. And, you know, to some extent, it, it may be somewhat naive to think that uh, removing, you know, one risk factor, removing just periodontal inflammation uh, when it's already present, you know, in people that have already been exposed to that uh, that periodontal inflammation for some period of time uh, before may not, you know, it may not in a relatively short-term trial produce a statistically significant change uh, that, that would make the, you know, meet the criteria for inclusion in something like a, a, a Cochrane review of, uh, of clinical trials. So, you know, again, you know, all these things are, are caveats to say that, you know, the absence of evidence is not equivalent to the uh, the the absence of an of a of a true causal association just just because we haven't yet demonstrated uh, the treating it reduces uh, the specific endpoints in these specific trials uh, doesn't mean that uh, the, the periodontal inflammation may not still play a causal role in these other conditions and you know again treating periodontitis once it's present is not necessarily the same as preventing periodontitis. From occurring in the first place, uh, you know we're we're coming in, you know, you know perhaps late stage in what has been a a long term chronic uh, causal mechanism, um, and we, we may not be intervening in a way or at a time point uh, in, in which uh, you know we've sufficiently um, intervened to present to prevent you know that causal mechanism. So again, j just things to remember, but. Uh, again, I you know I think that the the data that we have already for um, for type two diabetes, I, I think is already in my mind somewhat of a of a game changer in the in the conversation. You know, what we all already concluded, or at least my suggested conclusions from from part one, was uh, the evidence was sufficient to infer a causal relationship between periodontitis and glycemic control. In, in people with type two diabetes. And I'd say that the, the preponderance of evidence is suggestive, but perhaps not yet sufficient to infer causal relationships between periodontitis and either preterm birth uh, or cardiovascular disease. Doesn't mean that it's not there, just means that we, we don't yet have um, uh, sufficient evidence. So, you know, it leads us to, to really the, uh, the, the crux of, of the conversation today does periodontal treatment self save healthcare costs? So, you know, one side that we've looked at is 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 whether it it um, you know it, it prevents or alleviates uh, you know uh, health outcomes. You know, today we're talking about whether you know what what's the evidence that, that treating periodontal diseases uh, can save healthcare costs. So, so the first item we're going to talk about this actually. Uh, you know, created quite a splash when it came out about uh, about six, seven years ago uh, from uh, the late Marjorie Jeffcoat and, and, and her team uh, looked at a, uh, a large database of, uh, of, 
uh, of medical and dental claims from uh, insurers in uh, in Pennsylvania. And again, you know, pulling together a huge number of, um, of observations and over 300,000 um, uh, individuals represented in those claims. And they looked at a number of different uh, uh, different economic outcomes, uh, total medical costs, uh, as well as uh, the number of hospitalizations associated with, uh, with, with five different conditions, in this case, uh, uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and four, uh, four different uh, chronic diseases, including type two diabetes, uh, cerebral vascular disease, uh, coronary artery disease, and, and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you know, what, what became somewhat controversial, and there, there was a number of, uh, of letters to the editors that were submitted around this, was how they defined their, um, their, their treatment groups. Uh, they, they compared that for what they consider the periodontally treated group, uh, which uh, they defined as those that, re that received at least four visits uh, within, a, within a given calendar year for periodontal treatment. And their control group in that were, uh, were those that re received you know, none or, or I should say none, that received less than, uh, less than four treatments. Uh, they considered their control group and uh, you know, first I'll talk about the, the, the findings for diabetes. And again, just to give you an idea of the, the, the kinds of sample sizes, um, you know, they had in that database uh, about 91,000 um, uh, insured people that were diagnosed with, with, uh, with diabetes. Um, only about 1% of them, uh, you know, or about 900, uh, you know, had uh, evidence that, they, that, that at least one claim was submitted uh, for a periodontal treatment. You know, but you know, in that study, it actually found uh, you know pretty significant differences uh, between those that had the full course of periodontal treatment at, at the beginning uh, of this time period. So they they followed folks from uh, from from the 2005 through 2009. Uh, they, they received uh, you know either received full periodontal treatment in that first year or or didn't, and then followed you know starting with uh, the subsequent year, uh, their, their health care outcomes and use of, of health services. And, you know, what they found was actually pretty significant differences in the overall medical costs associated uh, with, you know, for those uh, among those who had uh, full periodontal treatment. I don't know if this will, if this will um, show on, on the slides, but uh, the, uh, the, the bottom curve uh, these, these are uh, the, the ones with marked with those uh, little diamonds. Uh, those are the the the, uh, the people that had um, uh, periodontal treatments or had at least four uh, periodontal treatments during the year. Uh, comparing the the cost to those that didn't have their full periodontal treatment, uh, pretty significant differences in their medical costs. Uh, you know, differences in in the thousands of dollars per person per year. And you know similar findings for inpatient admissions, uh, patients who uh, who had full periodontal treatment, uh, significantly fewer um, admissions per per thousand insured people compared to those that that didn't have uh, full periodontal treatment. So again, suggesting that those that uh, you know that were periodontally treated, uh, right? You know, again, at least. At least four treatments, uh, as recommended, uh, in the course of a year. You know, over the the subsequent four or five years, um, it had significantly lower healthcare costs, significantly lower admissions uh, for diabetes. Uh, they found pretty similar findings uh, in terms of uh, cerebrovascular diseases. Uh, you know, those that had periodontal treatment. That's the the uh, on. That chart on the left is, uh, is medical costs uh, throughout this period, consistently lower uh, healthcare costs compared to those that weren't periodontally treated and lower rates of, uh, of inpatient admissions among those that were periodontally treated compared to those that were not. And then finally in that study also looked at uh, coronary artery disease. And again, same pattern, uh, lower healthcare costs and lower inpatient admissions for those that had full periodontal treatment compared to those that did not. 
so, you know, there, again, there were, there were a number of criticisms uh, when that study first came out, although, you know, again, it's a uh, you know, fairly uh, large database, um, you know, to the extent that they could try to control for potential confounders. I say, you know, one of the strongest studies that came out subsequent to that, this is from, uh, if anybody recognizes those names, uh, this came out of uh, the American Dental Association's Health Policy um, uh, Institute. Uh, at, the, at the time that this was done, uh, Michael Glick, the third author, uh, had still been the editor for the uh, Journal of the American Dental Association at that time. Uh, Marco uh, uh, Vucevic is, um, is still uh, still with the Health Policy Institute. He was the, the second author on this. So this one, they, they looked at the relationship between periodontal care and healthcare costs and utilization. Um, and this, this study was specifically among adults with, uh, with type 2 diabetes. And again, using a, a large integrated database of, of medical, dental, and pharmacy claims. Uh, from the, This was a database from uh, comprised of, of, of a number of um, uh, of large uh, commercial insurers, um, in their in their analysis, uh, over fifteen thousand adults uh, with with newly diagnosed uh, type 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 two diabetes um, during that, that two year period of two thousand six two thousand seven uh, were, were included in the study. And what they then then did was uh, look at at uh, healthcare costs in years uh, three and four. For those who received uh, periodontal treatment during the the uh, two years uh, after this new diagnosis of, of type two diabetes, so again, I thought it was a, a fairly elegant uh, design. So you know, you have people newly diagnosed for type two diabetes uh, received or did not receive periodontal treatment in the two years uh, right after that diagnosis of, of type two diabetes, and then looked at healthcare. Uh, costs uh, in the uh, in the two years after that period where they did or did not receive periodontal treatment, and again, you know, the, these are the kinds of studies you you really can't do these things in in randomized clinical trials. It, it's um, you know for for you know for both logistics and 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 ethical reasons, um, you know, to uh, you, know, you you just can't. You just can't do clinical randomized clinical trials for some research questions. But what we what we try to do in these kinds of studies is to try to balance those those comparison groups as well as as, as you can, you know, given you know given nature. Um, and so the way that they try to do that is with uh, the use of what we call propensity scores, but based on things that we're you know that we're pretty sure you know are uh, potential confounders. Uh, of the association between uh, receiving or not receiving periodontal treatment and you know and the health outcomes, we try to adjust it for those you know using these propensity scores. And so they they did a uh, you know I'd say a, a fairly robust job of doing that in this um, in this particular study, and then calculated the average treatment effect uh, between those who received periodontal care and those that that did not. And so, what they uh, what what their findings in the study was that among uh, adults in their study with newly diagnosed type two diabetes, uh, those who received periodontal therapy in the the uh, the, the two years immediately after diagnosis uh, was uh, substantially lower healthcare costs. You know, again, average of about eighteen hundred dollars lower total healthcare costs, about sixteen hundred dollars lower medical costs. Lower uh, costs for you know directly related to to type two diabetes, uh, fewer hospitalizations, fewer emergency department visits, and fewer outpatient visits. So again, it's consistent with with what we would expect, you know, based on the epidemiologic evidence uh, that if we can better manage periodontal inflammation in people that with, with type two diabetes. Uh, we can better, we can achieve better glycemic control and, you know, and reduce the risk for subsequent use of other services because we've, uh, we've helped to prevent a lot of the, uh, the adverse outcomes related to type 2 diabetes. Similar studies, you know, I say, you know, that, that, that study, uh, I think, has really had a, a marked 
effect on subsequent studies uh, that have been done. Um, so a couple of studies done by, by groups in, in Europe uh, used uh, uh, similar uh, approaches. Uh, so, you know, we, we saw one on diabetes related healthcare that was done in the Netherlands. Um, this is uh, Stefan Listel's group. Uh, and, and they did some studies in both the Netherlands and in Germany. Again, did a retrospective analysis using seven years of uh, claim data from a large uh, commercial insurance company in the Netherlands, large number of people with, uh, with diabetes, which they, they defined you know, based on whether or not there had been a, a diabetes related healthcare claim. And then their outcome uh, was that was uh, diabetes related healthcare costs uh, per quarter. And again, compared those who received the periodontal treatment and those that did not. And I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of, of their, their analysis, but again, I have the, the reference there for those who, you know, who want that. But I really did try to take into account um, the, um, you know, sort of trying to, to account for, for potential confounders in, in making these kinds of comparisons. And what, what they uh, uh, generally found was that um, you know, receiving either any uh, periodontal treatment or and then they you know to, to try to look at whether there was a dose response effect looked at uh, you know those that received what they called intermediate periodontal treatment so this was you know generally uh, non-surgical uh, periodontal treatments um, and those that had more ad advanced uh, periodontal treatment and this includes among other things those that had uh, you know periodontal surgery as well as more advanced forms of, of periodontal treatment uh, but consistently found uh, pretty significant effects on receiving periodontal treatment in terms of subsequent uh, diabetes-related healthcare costs. Um, you know, and again, the, you know, the way to uh, 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 to interpret that is that there were reductions of a, of about uh, twelve euros, or you know, converting that dollars, you know, uh, you know, just under uh, thirteen dollars uh, per patient per quarter. In, uh, in reduction in diabetes-related healthcare costs after periodontal treatment. So again, you know, not not only very better uh, periodontal health because uh, that that condition had been treated, um, uh, you know, but uh, you know, re reductions in in their diabetes-related um, uh, their, their diabetes-related healthcare costs, and you know, again, consistent with what we might expect, those that had uh, advanced uh, periodontal treatment, so you know more aggressive forms of treating periodontitis um, had had uh, greater cost savings related to their uh, their periodontal. I mean, they're related to their their diabetic healthcare costs. Uh, similar study that that group did in uh, in Germany, looking at a longitudinal database of uh, a large number of, uh, of insured um, of, of Germans with with health insurance. Uh, that they had uh, tw about 23,000 that, that they had uh, continually insured uh, that had been newly diagnosed with diabetes in uh, 2013. And then similar to the, uh, the study that we saw um, from, from the, the, uh, the group at Health Policy Institute at ABA, uh, they measured the healthcare costs uh, several years uh, post-diagnosis. So again, they, they tried to identify, identify uh, newly people newly diagnosed with diabetes and then uh, if, at some point after receiving uh, periodontal care or not receiving it, then looked at the healthcare outcomes. And this diagram on the slide, you know, just kind of lays out the, the design. So they, you know, they, they measure pretend, potential, um, you know, covariates and confounders at the period uh, before the date of diagnosis. Uh, you know, then, then, you know, people newly diagnosed with, with, with diabetes, uh, then they receive uh, periodontal treatment uh, during that uh, couple of years right after diagnosis, and then the, the couple of years after that, looking at at uh, at, health, at, at uh, various types of of healthcare costs. Um, and this one, you know, although when, you know, I get the way to way to uh, to interpret this generally uh, points below that that long, the, the uh, that straight line across at the at 1.0 essentially means uh, you know, no effect. You know, so generally we saw, you know, with the exception of um, outpatient costs, where it really looked like 
you know, there wasn't much change. Um, you know, generally we saw, uh, you know, reductions, although not statistically significant in most healthcare costs associated with periodontal treatment, whether it's total healthcare costs, inpatient costs, diabetes related costs, or other drug costs. And, uh, and again, you know, the, um, the, the confidence intervals included one. So yeah, not statistically significant, but, you know, generally all pointing in the direction of being uh, lower healthcare costs among those that received periodontal treatment within the two years after diagnosis. A uh, study that came out uh, uh, more recently, uh, came out in uh, 2021, um, really looking at not, not just diabetes, but a number of, uh, of healthcare costs uh, in a uh, very large database um, of, uh, of Medicaid-insured adults in uh, New York State. So they used three years of claims and, and looked at um, the association between the receipt of, uh, of dental services, so not, not limited to periodontal services, but you know, all claims, including uh, preventive services, which would obviously also include uh, preventive services that would, um, that, that would affect periodontal health, and looked at uh, a number of different outcomes, including uh, all, all cause emergency department visits, inpatient admissions, and healthcare costs related to those uh, emergency department visits, inpatient visits, uh, and uh, pharmacy costs. A uh, large number of adults, and, and they uh, you know, limited to adults age 42 to 62, but still had uh, over half a million adults in their database. And, and similar to what I described with one of the earlier studies, they calculated uh, propensity scores. Again, it's a, um, a fairly elegant way to, to try to, uh, to, to, um, to control for, for a number of potential confounders and covariates in looking at these kinds of associations. And so you know, what they found in terms of uh, utilization uh, outcomes, uh, that, that those that had, you know, those adults in New York uh, Medicaid uh, that had received um, uh, at least one preventive dental visit in the, in the preceding two years, uh, on average had uh, reduced the uh, rate of using emergency departments, uh, uh, or having uh, inpatient admissions and significantly lower uh, healthcare costs. Um, so, you know, about, uh, you know, seven or eight dollars less uh, per member on emergency department costs, um, about 181 dollars less inpatient admission costs per person and uh, about 235 dollars uh, lower total adjusted healthcare costs. And again, suggesting that, uh, that that patients who receive preventive dental services, you know, on average, were less likely to wind up in a hospital, either emergency department or inpatient, and uh, you know tended to use uh, you know, lower healthcare dollars than people that did not receive preventive dental services. And again, is adjusted as well as as can be done. Um, for uh, you know, using uh, propensity scores uh, you know, to uh, to adjust for potential confounders in, in those analyses. So to, to summarize uh, summarize these, you know, you know, these are and I may have missed some out there, but I don't think I've missed any, any major studies. Uh, look look pretty thoroughly, uh, but based on the evidence we have so far, uh, the periodontal uh, treatment seems to be consistently associated with subsequently lower healthcare costs in adults with, with diabetes. So the, the studies that you know that were limited to people with diabetes or that included that as part of their study population you know, were pretty consistent in that finding. Uh, some studies found that periodontal treatment was associated with lower subsequent costs uh, associated with, uh, with other chronic diseases. Um, although, you know, granted there were fewer studies, but um, they, they, they were consistent. Uh, the, the use of preventive dental services predicted lower health care uh, costs in, a, in that large uh, Medicaid enrolled adult population in a, uh, a database of more than half a million uh, adults age 42 to 62. Uh, and again, I'd say overall, the, the findings from these, these uh, uh, health, uh, health economic studies, you know, looking at, at cost outcomes, 
uh, were consistent with the conclusions of epidemiologic studies suggesting uh, that those that, uh, that had their periodontitis treated, and I would say prevent, you know, in, extend that to being prevented, uh, seem to have lower risk uh, for, for uh, a number of major uh, chronic disease outcomes. So, you know, what, what are my interpretations of, of those implications? I would say that, you know, the, the preventive dental care and particularly periodontal treatment um, seems to improve oral health and general health outcomes in adults. And I'd say that evidence is probably strongest for those with diabetes. So we now have, I'd say fairly, you know, uh, quite consistent um, epidemiologic evidence suggesting uh, that periodontitis increases the risk uh, for, if not onset of type 2 diabetes, or at least uh, poor glycemic control. The treatment of periodontal disease uh, improves glycemic control uh, for adults with, uh, with diabetes. And the, treating their periodontitis not only improves their periodontal health and their, their diabetic health, uh, but saves money. And I'd say those studies all seem to be pretty consistent. Um, not, not as rich a, bit, a data set for other, uh, for other conditions, but they all seem to be pointing in similar direction. And I'd say paying for preventive dental care and periodontal treatment probably saves overall healthcare costs for adults at risk for, at, at risk for, for chronic diseases based on the best available evidence that we have at this time. What are what are my recommendations? And again, this is um, you know these are my opinion. It's not not those necessarily of of the coalition or or of my employer. But um, I'd say that we have a a, a, um, a pretty strong evidence base supporting uh, the need to increase adults' direct access uh, to preventive dental services. If if preventive dental services not only prevent uh, adverse oral health outcomes, and 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 we've got pretty compelling evidence on that side, but I'd say that the preponderance of evidence seems to suggest that preventing uh, uh, oral disease um, reduces risk for subsequent chronic disease. Uh, we, should, we should be increasing uh, adults' access, direct access to those preventive services by making those services um, uh, as accessible in, in many ways, and that includes um, you know, both, uh, both financial access as well as reducing barriers in providing services uh, delivered, for example, by dental hygienists. Uh, we, we, we should make those, uh, those services as, as widely available as possible. I think we have a, a, a quite compelling argument to make to uh, working towards greater medical and dental integration, you know, as People have been saying for, for many years, uh, oral health and, and overall health um, are intimately uh, connected. And I'd say, you know, certainly the emerging, um, the, the emerging information, you know, strongly supports that we, we need to do a much better job, um, you know, integrating management, particularly for those with, uh, with type two diabetes. Um, that, that uh, again, I think we now have uh, very, uh, you know, much stronger evidence that's just come out within the past year or so uh, that, that we really need to be addressing periodontal health in adults with, uh, with, with diabetes in terms of not only managing the oral health, but in, in terms of gly uh, better glycemic control. I, th I think we really have um, stronger evidence now uh, to be able to advocate for mandatory coverage of basic adult dental services in state Medicaid dental programs. Uh, the, the data I showed were from uh, New York State, one of the largest states in the country. I, so I'm, I'm quite confident that we will see uh, similar findings from, from other state dental programs. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we, we really need to move towards having a, a comprehensive set of, uh, of benefits for adults. Right now, it's, it's still optional. And for many states, um, you know, they, they have opted to provide the little or no uh, basic dental services. But I think that we, we have, I, th I think, we, I think the, the data are on our side to advocate for, um, for enhanced coverage of dental services in state Medicaid 
dental programs. And finally, I think that, um, you know, I think we've got a, a good case to advocate for uh, coverage of basic dental services as, as a, uh, a central part of uh, a basic uh, Medicare coverage. Um, I, I would say it belongs in Medicare Part B um, because I, as, uh, you know, I, with the, the evidence that we now have in terms of uh, reducing uh, adverse health outcomes as well as adverse, you know, healthcare cost outcomes. Um, again, I think we, we have, uh, we have the mounting evidence that we can help to prevent and manage uh, chronic diseases, uh, as well as overall probably save uh, healthcare costs, including uh, public expenditures. And so those are, those are sort of my takeaway recommendations. I, I know we have some from time, some uh, time for discussion, and hopefully people have been putting things into the chat box. Great, Dr. Tomar. Thanks for a really uh, amazing presentation and the connection between uh, oral health and systemic health. I did want to uh, provide just a caveat. It, it, could you back up to the last slide for just a second, Dr. Tomar? Sure. Um, these uh, recommendations are would be recommendations that the National Coalition of Dentists for Health Equity would uh, be working to move forward. Uh, but the caveat is that we recognize that the Region 5 Public Health Training Center uh, is not allowed to do any lobbying. Uh, they can do education. And so we just want uh, to make sure that in people's minds, there's a separation between uh, the recommendations that Dr. Tomar is making uh, I mean, he said it, those, these are his own personal recommendations, but these would be ones that the National Coalition of Dentists for Health Equity will work on, uh, but just trying to make the separation between us and Region 5 Public Health Training Center. So let me get to a couple of questions that did come up. Um, there is one in the chat uh, that I think you can see. Uh, it's from Dr. Hill, um, where he's saying, uh, in these studies regarding perio uh, for T2D, did any of the studies look at changes in other behavior that may have contributed to positive outcomes? He says, when I was diagnosed, I changed my diet, lost weight, and increased exercises. I also received dental care. To what do I associate the dramatic drop in my A1C? Is there anything you have that could respond to that? I mean, the best thing I can say, you know, again, on the, in terms of the studies, and I presented um, you know, some of those studies uh, in the, in my last presentation, the, the studies that are ultimately summarized in the, um, the Cochrane Review, and I, and I just put the, the conclusions up at the beginning of this presentation, those were all randomized clinical trials. And, and so we, we have, you know, again, we would assume, yeah, certainly there could be other factors but we would think that in a randomized clinical trial, if somebody was was randomized to get their their periodontitis treated, you know, you know, earlier or more more thoroughly, you know, versus those that were not, you know, we would think that some of those other behavioral changes would be balanced in the two groups. So, so you know, again, the conclusion. I'd say the, the conclusion, you know, from those randomized clinical trials as summarized uh, by, the, by the, the most recent Cochrane Review, take into account that, well, yeah, there's probably other things going on, but the, the best available evidence suggests that managing periodontal disease, managing, you know, treating periodontitis um, improves glycemic control. You know, all other things, you know, the same. Great. Great. Thanks. Sure. So if there's someone who is a participant in this webinar who's newer to the field of dentistry or just someone lacking the leverage or level of influence on decisions, what can they do to push the needle uh, in their own local communities? Uh, who can they get in touch with to help uh, in, in their own work of uh, making changes in the community? Great question. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a strong believer in uh, in working in, in health coalitions, whether it's an oral health coalition or 
uh, if there are other uh, other health related coalitions, because they, you know, it tends to bring to, you know, I mean, you know to me, the beauty, and, and I've, I've been involved with, with a number of different oral health coalitions, so I could probably speak best from those, but you know, bring, the, bring together people that, you know, they're, they're not all dentists or dental hygienists in the room, you know, people that get involved with this because they work with uh, with older adults who are having problems with with accessing oral health or, you know, it's like, oh yeah, my, you know, so they found out that they've got diabetes, they think they've got periodontitis, but, you know, can't afford the care or whatever. So people that, you know, tend to get involved in these coalitions because they all have a different reason for being there. Uh, you know, we've had people from local school boards that have served or, or local school systems that have served on that. Uh, but the, the beauty is we all can put together our, you know, our, you know, our imagination. We all have limited resources, but if you pool all your energies, um, you can actually, you can actually make some changes. You can speak to your local, um, you know, local, uh, you know, policymakers uh, to try to move the needle. So, you know, again, if, if we want to focus on, for example, periodontal health and people with diabetes, well, so if, you know, if you find out, is there a local, um, a, a local group of, you know, people with, um, you know, with type two diabetes, uh, you know, who are all dealing with similar issues around, you know, finding resources and treatment and, and support. Um, well, maybe, maybe there isn't an oral health voice there. So you could be a valuable contributor, uh, or conversely, if there's a, a local oral health coalition, well, maybe they need to hear from somebody uh, that's, you know, that's involved in, in some of the chronic diseases that have a tie-in with oral health. And again, working together, you know, try, try to move, um, you know, try to move action in your local community, uh, you know, wh whether that's, you know, creating resource guides, uh, you know, advocating for, for services, uh, at the state level, you know, advocating for, for example, Medicaid coverage changes. Um, but, but I think there's a, there's a lot that can be done grassroots. It doesn't all have to be federal legislation. So um, are there any examples of case studies that you're aware of that highlight the positive impact of periodontal therapy on chronic diseases? Something from your practice or maybe from a, a colleague? I'd say where I've seen, you know, where, where I've seen the most action is um, probably uh, interacting with, with local physicians, um, particularly those that work with the, some of the patients uh, that have these conditions. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, I use uh, diabetes as the, you know, as sort of the, the poster child. And I'd say we probably have the strongest evidence now. Um, I, I think, uh, I, you know, I think the physicians that that are working with, uh, with with adults with type two diabetes, which is now unfortunately becoming, you know, a more prevalent part of their uh, of their um, uh, of their patient population, I think them becoming more sensitized to it. I, I've I've just seen more um, more interest in trying to uh, to find uh, oral health care for for their patients, um, and so we're. We're actually, uh, you know, we're actually in the process of opening a clinic. Um, you know, now, speaking of my, my, uh, you know, my, my home institution, uh, so our our division uh, is now opening a clinic co-located with a primary care clinic. You know, in part because they're seeing a lot of patients with chronic diseases, and what we're hearing from the docs there is, yeah, I, I know that they're having dental problems that might be related to this condition. I've got no place to send them. And so we're we're now opening literally on the other side of the waiting room. We're, we're, we're uh, opening a clinic, should be an operation in, in a couple of months. Um, so, uh, so some of the local success stories, hopefully we'll have you know, more success stories until next year, um, but, you know, I think these are the kinds of things that I'm seeing and I'm hearing it. Uh, same thing for my colleagues at FQHCs. I'm glad you brought up the federally qualified health centers because uh, many in Ohio have physicians and dentists co-located in the same building. And if you're an oral health provider, uh, you can uh, offer to volunteer 
You can uh, support the work of the local uh, federally qualified health center uh, by bringing this, this to everybody's attention. I, I did want to add, though, that there was a point just a couple of years ago where we were in a very long discussion about uh, coordinating care. And the crux of it was the patient-centered medical home, uh, the PCMH here in Ohio. And when I got involved in the discussion, I found that oral health care was not any part of that, the, the conversation that was going on. I actually had to <laughs> raise my hand and bring the question into the room, where, where are the dentists? Um, and th this group of learned people who were dealing with primary health care really hadn't begun thinking about it in that way. Uh, that may have changed since then, but the, the reality is that it, it since that division between your physical health and your oral health has been so long term, it really takes people being in the room and raising the question in order for it to come to the fore. So. Yeah, I absolutely. There's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a probably a separate discussion is is the barriers to, you know, to, to better integration. But you know, here again, you know, we work a lot with uh, with local FQHCs. We have our students, you know, rotating to. Uh, we now have about thirty of them, you know, that, that we uh, that we partner with. Um, and so even ones that are co-located with, with medicine and dentistry, um, they're, they're on different uh, healthcare, you know, electronic healthcare systems. So they, you know, yeah. again, you know they, they can literally walk down the hallway to get, to get a consult, but it's not quite as seamless as being able to, you know, having a, you know, uh, an easy way to make that, you know, that warm handoff to make that referral uh, to, you know, to easily access each other's records. Uh, and we have it here at our school. I mean, we're our, our dental school sits on, in, in, you know, in, in the heart of a major medical center. Uh, the rest of which is on Epic, and we're on Axiom. So we we we, we still don't 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 quite talk to each other all that much. Um, Got it. But yeah, that, that's that's a, that's a whole separate discussion. How we break down these barriers. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, um, we're about at time, so I am going to thank you very much again for the presentation and for your time today. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Donnie to come back in and uh, lead us out. Yeah, thank you so much, David. And thank you, Dr. Tomar, for the presentation and for answering all these questions. Um, just a note to all of our participants here with us today. As we're wrapping up, I did put the link for the evaluation in the chat. So if you'd like to earn your official certificate of completion, um, please be sure to com complete that. It'll be open for a week and um, feel free to reach out to us if there are any follow-up questions. I will put our email in the chat as well. That is rvphtc at umich.edu. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap for today. So thank you all so much and have a great rest of the day.